Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Zach Morse, and thanks for sticking around for the last session of the day uh, to hear about what we did. I'll start off by saying um, the old old uh, phrase goes, it takes a village, uh, and I just want to recognize all the co-authors on here. It's a long list, one of the longest I've ever worked with, and without everybody on there, this wouldn't have been possible. Um, so uh, I'm here to tell you about some work we did with the Rise 2 team in March or April of this year. Um, and this is... Uh, oh, does this... Uh, there it goes. Okay. Um, this is work that we did uh, with theme two of Rise 2, which looks at handheld instrumentation and field operations. And the the purpose of this field um, exp uh, expedition was to simulate a series of EVAs, some that used instruments, things that produce data in the field, and some that did not have instruments, just basic tools, similar to the Apollo era, where they were using basic you know, rock hammers, core drills, that sort of thing, and compare that to the EVAs that had more advanced instrumentation to collect data, similar to what has been proposed for Artemis IV and beyond. Uh, and we did this by having uh, four teams uh, or four pairs of astronauts. They're shown here. Uh, and again, thanks to all the, these folks, who, some of whom are in the room, some are online. Um, without them, this definitely would have been possible. Uh, and they spent a lot of time out in the sun, in the dust, uh, doing the hard work uh, while we kind of facilitated them to do that. And so uh, our field site was the Kilburn Hole Impact, uh, I'm sorry, Kilburn Hole uh, Volcanic volcanic Crater. Uh, it's a mar crater in the desert of New Mexico. Uh, and we uh, focused it on three specific locations, uh, one at the north, one towards the southeast, and one towards the southwest. And you'll see uh, six polygons pop up here labeled one through three, A and B. The A designates the first traverse, essentially, um, where the astronauts would visit on, on their first day in the field with no instruments. And the B uh, boxes designate the second set of, of stations they would visit with instrumentation their second day in the field. Uh, ooh, loading. That's interesting. There we go. So the, the way this worked, it wasn't uh, like a prescribed EVA that you might see uh, for Artemis. It was more um, up to the astronauts in the field to make real-time decisions, and we were observing their decision-making process as they went. Uh, the first 10 minutes, this is uh, Traverse A without instruments, uh, dedicated to sort of station recon, observation, getting their bearings. The majority of their time in the field was spent uh, executing actions, and then the last 10 minutes was for wrap-up um, with a 15-minute uh, summary and synthesis after each station. Uh, without instruments, this is sort of their cuff checklist of things. You don't have to read this whole thing. It's a bit of an eye chart. Um, but just to say that the high priority uh, actions we wanted them to take were to collect samples, collect photos, and make observations. Um, each traverse could collect up to 10 hand-sized rock samples. That was their sample limit and sort of one metric for success of the EVA. Uh, although they did not have instruments, they did have access to a map book analysis to what the Artemis III astronauts might have. And this contained basic information like a scale bar, a uh, grain size chart, but also a series of maps uh, of the Kilborn Hole area, uh, both visible imagery and topographic information. And these were done at different scales, but always with lunar analogous resolution. Even down to the station uh, scale, this might seem blurry to those of you in the room, uh, but this is just because we're using LRO uh, analogous resolution for this imagery that shows uh, the two polygons for stations uh, 1A and B, and then the topography information for that same area. So this is just a reference the astronauts could have at any point uh, to check uh, during EVA. Uh, Traverse B with the instruments, this is where it gets a little more exciting. The timeline looks very similar. The first 10 minutes is all about station recon and preparation. The majority of their time is executing actions now involving instruments, and then 10 minutes for wrap-up at the end and a 15-minute debrief after. Uh, this is the cuff checklist for the with instruments uh, EVA. And the big difference here is there were three mandatory must be done actions at each of the stations. This was to ensure that each of our instruments got a chance to be used during the EVA and to sort of guide the astronauts in the right direction uh, at each of the stations. Uh, so each of the instruments, we had four instruments that they had available. Um, aside from the one mandatory use, they could use these at any point. Each did have a time requirement to process data. But the big thing this year was that the data was available in real time or near real time. The first of which is an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer or XRF. You put that up to the rock, pull the trigger, and within a few seconds, uh, it generates a lot of numerical data about the mineralogy of the rock. But this year specifically, thanks to Jared and Ben and Cherie, uh, we had the amazing X-Rise device um, that connected via Bluetooth to the XRF and sort of did the translation for you. So within seconds, you had a ternary diagram readout of the rock that you were scanning, allowing for real-time exploration and decision-making. It was awesome. So thanks for that, Jared, Ben, Shree. Um, other instruments we had, uh, we had a portable GPR. The astronauts would drag along the surface and look for reflections that represented buried boulders or layers beneath where they were walking to kind of get that subterranean aspect. 
Um, there was a advanced uh, hyperspectral imager, which we zoom in here. This is a prototype instrument, so it was still a bit finicky to use. We had a separate team dedicated to operating this, but the astronauts would indicate the field of view they wanted. And then this instrument over about 20 to 30 minutes of integration time would generate a false color image representing the mineralogy within the rocks in that designated field of view. So it wasn't immediate, but the astronauts could then use this image presented to them on an iPad to make decisions about what rocks to sample, what the compositions were. Um, and that sort of thing. And the last uh, data set they had access to was topographic data, mostly LIDAR from tripod mounted and drone based LIDAR things. Patrick has a talk coming up next about some of the topographic um, data that was involved in RISE 2, so I won't steal his thunder too much and kind of skip over this one for now. Um, one other thing we had, it, was, it turned out to be amazing. Uh, every astronaut, each of the pairs, both would wear a chest mounted GoPro camera. And so this provided us with video and audio recording of all the EVAs from both of their perspectives, everything from selecting a rock to working together. Uh, and what this also provided us with was GPS tracks for uh, where the astronauts were at every point during each EVA. So this is sort of a modern art piece, if you will, um, but it represents by color where each of the pairs of astronauts or each individual astronaut walked, uh, again, with uh, stations A, or 1A and 1B there. Um, so now we have a physical sort of traverse path, but we also have a timeline of where they were. And since every note that was taken, every picture that was taken has a timestamp, we can essentially put together almost a rise in real time, uh, like Ben's Apollo in real time, for all the data that was generated. Speaking of, uh, we had generated a lot of data, and there's actually a typo on the slide. There were eight separate EVAs with and without instruments for each of the four pairs, um, spread over the three stations per EVA, and about two hours spent at each station generated about 48 hours of solid EVA data, which is quite a bit. Uh, and it's not just the, the notes, it's all of the recordings, all of the images. Um, we had observers working uh, with the teams that were mostly off camera and some of the pictures I was showing. Um, we had the GoPro telemetry, all the samples that were collected and the astronauts um, reasoning for collecting those samples. Uh, it's, it's a stack of information. Um, and so uh, it's, we're still kind of crunching through this a little bit, uh, kind of processing um, exactly what we have. We've actually uh, been talking about implementing an AI language model to help crunch some of the data. The audio um, recordings from the GoPros have been translated into text transcriptions. So we have a huge text file of, of all the words that were spoken at any given moment during the EVA. And we also have all the actual notes that uh, folks took. So lots of text-based data that we're hoping to kind of uh, tackle soon. Um, but the big two takeaways were that, uh, or at least the initial two takeaways, were that both the with and without instrument traverses, uh, all of the teams successfully collected their 10 samples. This didn't all happen at the same time. There were uh, lots of good discussions, lots of good decisions made. Um, but even with the extra cognitive load of operating the instruments, they still had time, the same time window for each EVA uh, to collect the 10 samples. Uh, the other big takeaway, thank you, um, was that several of the participants did note that extra cognitive load. So when you have these extra instruments, um, it's not as simple as scouting around and then using your, you know, uh, latent geologic knowledge to interpret a site, but you have to figure out the timing involved with an instrument, where you're going to use each instrument, and how that data is going to affect your decision. So they reported this additional cognitive load with the instruments, which led to, some said, uh, less general observations of the field site, but a more data-dense um, end result for the traverse. So a data that could be downlinked to a mission control and sort of uh, processed by scientists from the EVA on to the future. And so we're still working to see what, what the true trade-off was, but I think very positive indications for uh, the Rise 2 trip this year. And so I'll end by saying thanks again to the team. This is just a few of us pictured here. Um, it was an awesome group to work with, uh, everyone from the journalism students who are out with us to the scientists, each doing their own thing. Uh, and I'm very thankful to have been a part of it. And thanks to you guys for listening.